Councillor Guy McGregor, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'll try and confine my uh, remarks to local issues, I think, but uh, I I'm grateful to Sandy Martin for his amendment and the hard work his political officer has put into this. It certainly justifies the council taxpayers' uh, money in this valuable and useful exercise because it enables us to examine what their real priorities actually are. <coughs> Forget about finance. Forget about, in fact, the increase in the council tax, which would be an honest thing to do. Say to people, yes, we want to do these things, and we put your council tax up. But no, he goes and hides behind the idea of raiding the reserves. Typical Labour reaction to problems in terms of finance. Borrow and spend other people's money. I would genuinely have thought that this, in election year for local government, there'd be better response from the Lib Dems. At least something to see which we get our teeth into. Not a bit of it. Uh, UKIP, well, I was waiting for some sense out of them, and it never came. However, uh, the amendment here is a potpourri of, of, shall we say, nice things we may care to do. But in reality, let's look at some things they're opposing. Let's take the issue again of the library service. It is a fact that Labour control councils have reduced the hours more and closed more libraries than Conservatives. And, that, and yet they say the library service needs extra money. Well, not, not, not so. My own example in Stradbrook, of course, is in fact now a standalone library is now more successful than ever before. It's now got a post office providing a better service for the people of Stradbrook. So change can be for the better. It need not be for the worse. In terms of children's centres, it seems to me the Labour Party has fixation for buildings. It's the services we're concerned with. In my own particular vision, the centre at I provides a massive outreach in terms of, of the people it serves. And there are now more people being served, young people and their parents being served than ever before, in terms of the services provided by children's centres. In terms of the proposal about education and welfare officers, insurance officers, it seems to me, yet again, Labour don't get it. The whole problem, the whole challenge which we face is the issue of a significant number of chaotic families which need a whole family approach. And the idea is that just say we employ more education and welfare officers will solve the problem is simply not borne out by facts. Also, in terms of the issues, it seems to me that in terms of the, the other issues we're faced with in, in, this, in this council, um, does concern me. It does concern me. Because if you look at our young people's budget, about £27 million is spent upon the children which we are directly responsible for. There are about 725, 725 young people with a budget of £27 million. That's £35,000 per child. Now, if the outcomes were as good as they should be, I would certainly not begrudge the money, but I do think we need a better way of working in terms of those particular reasons. There are many factors why these young people don't achieve. They come from impoverished backgrounds, often, often abuse, very difficult to deal with. But I do feel, in terms of where we're spending our money, we should get better results from this. But this combined debate, what is a headline message? Well, the headline message basically is, yet again, no increase in your council tax. And that this is a natural order of things. The Conservative Party is in control in Suffolk, and a result of which you have a well-run, well-managed authority. The budget indicates there will be revenue savings of £30 million. But to come back to the energy from waste debate, which, Ed, which was picked up by John Goodwin, this was the article he was referring to. Eddie Alcock managed this particular project in the teeth of the opposition. Of the opposition. And the result has been not just a more efficient way of dealing with our waste, but genuine savings in our costs. And those costs have been pumped back into the services in this county council. So you can do things better, and we do do things better. I urge this council to reject the amendment and support the budget. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Graham Newman. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, you know, we've had a bit of lecturing today, Mr Chairman, about um, how we're squirrelling away resources. But I come to item 24 on the Labour Party's amendment. And I find that actually members opposite are actually squirrelling quite a lot of money. Um, there is, in fact, £285,000 in unspent local highways budget. Eight lower stopped area councils have together amassed a mass of £191,000 in local highways budget. In addition to this, it's which locality councils in this room have about £46,000 in the locality budgets not spent yet this year, £40,000 from that equivalent eight lower stock councillors, including one who's got £16,000 yet to spend. 
Now, in that circumstance, ladies and gentlemen, I just cannot see any justification whatsoever for for setting up a a special fund, £1.5 million, uh, for these areas. And if Councillor Gage really seriously thinks we're frittering away the on-street, uh, on-street parking account, let me tell her about the £100,000 plus we're going to spend in Carlton Colville. The first time in 35 years that someone's actually said, we are solve the problem with parking. We're trying to solve the problem with problem. So we're, we're doing that. And we're spending on-street parking account money to do that. Think about the lovely cycle bridge now we've got at, at Bury St Edmunds. You know, we couldn't have gone ahead with that unless we could have found some match funding in a hurry. In fact, we put £300,000 into that project from the on-street parking account. Think about the nice new cycleway we've got between Mildon Hall and West Row. Investment there that will save us money over time when people start to use that to cycle to school instead of having to have a bus provided for them. £50,000 we could be able to find for that project. £400,000 going towards drainage work in various parts of the county. Lots of people have said we need to do more work on that. £400,000 found from the on-street parking account to do just that. I don't think by any manner of means, Mr Chairman, we're fritting away or saving money unnecessarily. We're spending it on the projects that everybody in this council, every member, needs to have seen done in their, in their, local, in their local areas. If I just move on to uh, another little question, um, points 16 and 23, which I think broadly could be said to speak about home to school, uh, further education or first employment transport. And I agree these points with Councillor Chambers, who's the budget holder. Labour Group are proposing an amendment to use reserves to increase expenditure in this area. There's just two points I need to make about this, and it has actually been mentioned earlier. Firstly, funding is already available to cover suggested needs, and I'll explain that in a minute. Secondly, many times we have said in this chamber that spending reserves in this manner, as many of my colleagues have said, is just unsustainable. Provision is already in place for families on low income, able to apply for up to sorry, able to apply for the post-16 provider uh, bursaries up to £1,200 from the school or college that they're attending to support travel costs. As you say, we've introduced the Endeavour card, and yes, it doesn't have anything like the numbers we used to have on the Endeavour card because it's not available for everybody, and it's not causing council tax um, payers to have to find £2 million a year. It's actually been done effectively free of charge to this council, except for the cost of administering it. So I think that is pretty good. We are supporting uh, the, um, people... I accept in a, in a more limited way than we used to, but as has been said, we have to cut our cloth, uh, our suit to match our cloth. And finally, a uh, single point that Councillor Hackett was making earlier on, you know, if he likes to vote Conservative on May the 7th, he'll get the opportunity, like everybody in this room, to vote for whether we should stay in the EU or not. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Gardner, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I I promise I will be brief at this late hour. Um, I really want to pick up on the business about cutting the grants to the voluntary sector organisations because I think this is significant and it has been mentioned previously, briefly. Um, But I think that we're leaving some of those organisations very close to folding. Just think how many requests you might have had for locality budget funding, for example, from voluntary organisations simply because the money that the County Council previously put in is not now available and they cannot do the level of work and the services that they provide to those that are most in need. And there's an obvious gap there. Now, they have very little opportunity to raise other funds, and that's why they come to us for locality budgets, some of which we can meet, some we can't because of the criteria that we have. Of course, some of those services were previously provided by Suffolk County Council, but of course, quite conveniently, under the banner of Big Society, which I'd written down before somebody else mentioned it over there, of course, they were handed over on the basis that the voluntary sector organisations will be able to pick up those services and still provide them and then obviously pick up the tab for them as well. Quite clearly, we cannot afford to make further cuts into those voluntary organisations. We should reverse those cuts in order to protect those services that are most needed by the community in Suffolk. There are just a couple of other points that I'd like to make. It seems to me that um, the local government has not been taking its share of government cuts. 
In fact, it's been taking more than its fair share of government cuts, and I don't think there's anybody in this chamber who would disagree with that. Um, and the Labour government would not be taking the same approach as Eric Pickles, who for some reason still gets mentioned in this council chamber. How many times do we have to say that the reserves are going up and up and up? And the figures are there and they speak for themselves. We've heard all the reasons why um, it's necessary to keep them. If you do not support this amendment, then the reserves are likely to carry on going up and up. And we don't want to spend all the reserves. It's just a reminder that we're actually taking it back to the increase since 2010. I support the amendment. Councillor Stringer, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, colleague to my right would like to remind you he's missing pointless to be uh, involved in this. Uh, and on, and on, on the theme of pointless, I'll carry on. Uh, right. Uh, it's, it's been a bit of a, a confusing budget this year for, for certain backbenchers like myself. Uh, all this mention of Eric Pickles and elastic limits and all that, it's all getting a little bit twisted out of shape. I wasn't going to talk at all, like I wasn't going to talk at all last year, until Councillor Noble spoke, and then I felt the need that I absolutely had to. I nearly this year did a point of order, because you used the word, the Labour instigated dire financial situation. The Labour Party did not instigate this. Uh, how it occurred, slight history lesson, how it occurred, my time to speak, uh, how it occurred was that it was actually a bit of outsourcing, really. There was a huge problem with sort of welfare and getting people into housing, and a state didn't really want to pay for that. So they got a third sector organisation involved and some speculative property developers, and they came up with a fabulous way of turning benefits into mortgages. And that basically wrecked the world's economy. So that's what we need to be careful of. All right, that's just what we need to be careful of. So it wasn't their fault, wasn't your fault. And actually, if you want to look in, actually, if you want to look in Hansard, uh, six months before that big crash, a certain David Cameron was arguing that we needed to release some of the shackles in the city of London so they could trade even more fast and furiously. So be a little bit careful for what you ask for. You just might get it. Right, I'm now going to impart a, a, how I'm going to vote on this. And actually, I'm going to not vote. For it, I'm going to vote against everything today. Do you know why? And I'll tell you why. It, it's based on a bit of conscience and actually some backbone. I feel your amendment, actually, they've got a point. That is far too timid for you to come up with. Actually, if, you, it, if, if Timothy Weeks Passmore can write to every parish council in my area asking to put the council tax up by £3.26p a week to help fund raises he needs to make in policing, I think we could have done something similar if we needed to actually raise some extra income. So I take that point from you, and actually I won't support it because I think you should have been a little bit less timid. But equally, I won't be voting for your budget either, because it is absolutely not transformational enough by any stretch of any imagination at this stage. Other districts around you, two of them that I have knowledge of, and one of them that Councillor Anthill sits on, is about to borrow more than two and a half times its entire annual budget to actually get involved in ways of delivering stuff for communities as well as making a financial return. So, actually, I think we need to be looking a little bit around. And some of those people, some of those uh, councils, are looking at actually buying capacity in officer capacity from here, just hiring our own uh, 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 therapist so we can get our disability grants out there because it seems to be too slow here. We're actually, you know, I think sometimes you, you, you might be missing a trick. Equally, I'd, I also take a point from over here, and I never thought I'd say that. Actually, I think you need to be a bit stronger in Parliament, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too waspy with them, but what I would do, if you, if you go to Westminster, and I've been there once, probably won't get invited again, but we're, we're, if you do go there and you're talking to a minister, if you just want to remind them of Suffolk, Point across the bridge at the statue of Boudicca. She came from around here. Remind them of when London annoyed Suffolk when she was around here. And remind them of what she did when she got to London. She raised it to the ground. So actually I think just reminding of how we... <laughs> well, uh, absolutely. But, but equally, look what happened to London. So I, I think there's, there's, a, there's an element of perhaps just reminding them that we, we, we are very tolerant here in Suffolk, but, but when we break, 
uh, we certainly do break. Thank you. Councillor Craig. Thank you, Chairman. Um, social work has provided the glue in some young people's lives. Children who have suffered in ways we cannot imagine. But this council keeps cutting the numbers of social workers, leading to ever more pressure in an already highly pressured job. There are simply not enough social workers. Because of that, workloads and stress are higher than they should be. Stress-related sick leave levels are high. More sick leave means increased workloads. Increased workloads means more stress-related absence. The increased workload means that staff are being forced back to work too quickly, creating more stress and more sickness. We are sleepwalking into a downward spiral and failing these children who need us the most. I know that many of them find it quite distressing and unsettling when they have frequent changes of the social workers. I urge you to look at these so-called transformation projects in detail and look behind the glossy words to see the impact of these cuts on those who need your support and help the most. I urge you to vote for this amendment. Thank you. Councillor Armitage, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Overall, Suffolk schools have improved, even with the nationwide drop in attainment. However, there are clusters of schools in Ipswich and Lowestoft which have significantly deteriorated over the last year or two. Secondary schools depend much on good quality teaching in feeder schools to provide them with high calibre students, enabling them to get good GCSE results. Where secondary schools do badly, it is generally due to the poor education of the children coming into them. It therefore makes sense to work with pyramids of schools in areas of poor attainment. It is not enough to help the secondary schools when the problems start in the primary feeder schools. It is true that some of the worst performing secondary schools in Suffolk are academies, and you may well argue that it is not our responsibility as a local authority to help academies. But we have a duty of care to all the children of Suffolk, not just those who go to a local authority school. Other local authorities help academies, so why can't Suffolk? when there is such obvious need. The question for us is not what is your status, but how can we help? No one wants their child to go to a school with an 18 or 24% chance of getting five A star to C grades at GCSE. But for too many parents in Ipswich, this is the reality. And in Lowestoft, the picture is even grimmer, with three out of four secondary schools being inadequate. Where are children there supposed to go to get a good education? Raising the bar is all very well, but we need to start helping the schools right at the bottom, as well as the schools which are already improving. Suffolk needs to stop schools from failing the children of Suffolk by whatever means necessary. And if that requires providing extra funding, then that is what we must do. This amendment looks to develop and improve the support within the whole school pyramid, in areas where communities need it most, where the schools have been rated as inadequate by Ofsted, by embedding learning not just in schools but in our local communities. This amendment will ensure children's centres and nurseries are working with the primary schools to ensure children going into reception class are school ready. Primary schools need to work with secondary schools to ensure that key stage three subjects are not alien to children when they arrive at that school. But more than that, to build educational support in the community that helps parents with their literacy and numeracy skills, and to ensure whatever wider support that is specific to the needs of that school pyramid is provided. These wider services will mean parents can help children with their homework, that they can foster an enjoyment for learning and teaching that will help support children across those areas that need it most. Over the last academic year from 2013 to 2014, the GCSE results of six secondary schools in Suffolk have fallen to such a level that they are failing, and only one has improved from failing, so that it now has a 44% 5 A star to C grade. This is not good enough. We desperately need to improve Suffolk schools now. The children who are in school now can't wait for long-term improvements. Changes need to be made straight away. Children only have one chance at their education, and it is our responsibility, our duty as councillors, 
to make sure that their time spent in education is beneficial and productive to help them reach their potential. Their future is the future of Suffolk. We have shown in our budget amendment that we can afford to give these schools financial help. So let's invest in our future, our children's future. Councillor Gordon-Jones, please. Um, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, within the constraints of a significantly reducing resources for the Council, I continue to be committed to delivering the clear vision we have of safer, happier children and enabling families to create and sustain change for themselves. A novel experience uh, for the party opposite who continue to think that only the state can do that. The budget proposals we are placing before the Council are all about reshaping children and young people's services in order to meet the needs of the families we work with, remaining, remaining effective in the future and achieving best outcomes within the available resources. We have managed to deliver these savings by working alongside partners to develop a model of service that will reduce duplication and ensure purposeful and focused work. Our new practice model, Signs of Safety, is proving immensely popular with our staff, our partners, and, most importantly, our families. The Making Every Intervention Count Transformation Programme will deliver 5.1 million of savings through, as far as possible, a single plan at family level and one lead worker with common, common skills supporting individual professional disciplines. This is how family tell us they want us to deliver our services with our partners. You will have seen in Annex D that the savings have been made by reducing the number of managers and support staff to focus resources on practitioners working directly with families. The good practice around Suffolk family focus work will be mainstreamed in our multi-agency teams. The success of this initiative has resulted in additional income through the Payment by Results Initiative. There is still explicit focus on early help within the multi-agency teams in order to continue with the progress made in raising school attendance and attainment. But there will always be children who will need our most intensive support. And you will note that as part of this programme, I have safeguarded the social work service from reductions to ensure there is no impact on the most vulnerable and in need. We and our partners need to make every intervention count, both because that is the right thing to do for children, young people and their families, and because we cannot afford to have systems that are wasteful of resource. Together with our partners, we are confident we have arrangements that provide support for our most vulnerable children, ensure focus on early help and prevention services, and have new arrangements that work better to raise attainment and support young people to achieve the very best they can and help make Suffolk a thriving place to live and work for years to come. <coughs> Dealing with the amendment, the CYP General Reserve is forecast to be 6.1 million by the end of this financial year. However, our current estimate of future one-off costs, such as redundancy, pay protection, investment in IT, and the structural deficit on looked after children, means that these reserves will be used by the end of the 2017-18 uh, financial year on the appropriate things for, for these sort of reserves. Labour's answer is always just to throw money at an issue, somebody else's money, which is why the, the country was in the state it was in May 2010, <laughs> and have an ability and have an inability of working smarter and giving families the ability to help themselves. Many of Labour's amendments are just regurgitation of issues raised and addressed during the year, such as point seven. However, we we are already working closely with our health colleagues who have the responsibility for the diagnosis of autism and ADHD and have, and have enhanced this service, uh, especially for young people, the 11, 11 plus. We will continue to spend approximately 9.1 million on support and education for children with autism. 
Managing demand is very much the main plank of our making every intervention count and signs of safety. Reforms, are, reforms there is no evidence that reinstating items 9 and 10 will have any impact on outcomes. I have previously responded to the Suffolk family focus issue, but it should be noted that the success of this initiative had, has enabled us to be an early be beneficiary under phase two. The project is payment by results, and we are clearly having good results. I have covered children's centres many times already in this chamber, and I expect our dedicated staff to improve outcomes in the delivery of, of services they redesigned, and of course do. I would add, however, there are no proposals to reduce staff, and I take Councillor Cook's comment, it's not just about buildings, it is about the service. Our budget is about working with our partners to provide a more efficient and effective service to the young people of Suffolk and their families whilst living within our means. In contrast, Labour's is all about spend, 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 without improving the delivery of service and putting some of our most vulnerable children, our looked-after children, at risk by wasting reserves which are earmarked for them. Excuse me, Councillor Jones. Could I invite you to draw your comments? I will do. Thank you. I say, as a chartered accountant, unlike Councillor Hackett, I cannot and will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Leader of the Council, Mark B, please. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Chairman. Well, we have heard a lot of rhetoric this afternoon, but I guess, you know, we are only 80 days or so from a general election, so it is to be expected. And I think it's been very interesting to hear from the political groups, and I think, like Councillor Stringer said, I think I'm rather disappointed with the feebleness of the amendment that we have here because of the fear that the Labour group has. But like Councillor Spicer, I was somewhat surprised by Councillor Martin's comments about us driving around in large cars and private uh, schools and all of that. And I thought, yes, that is a bit of Ed Balls, you know. And to paraphrase, was it uh, Heseltine who said, that's not Martin, that's Balls. <laughs> I was also a bit disappointed to hear from the Labour group that all they want to do is raid reserves, as we've heard, with absolutely no idea of what we're going to do in the future. Because, as we heard quite sensibly from Councillor Belfield, what are you going to do in the years ahead? How are you going to sustain these things? That is not the way forward. And I'm sorry, hearing from our colleagues in, in UKIP, who seriously think that the level of savings that we are having to do responsibly on this side of the chamber with the government that is in place at the moment that has to tackle these difficult things, there was clearly difficult spending plans that the Labour Party talked about as well, because that is the reality of the world that we are in. Things have moved on. It is not the way that it was. And taxing things is not going to be the way turbines or chihuahuas in Councillor Flood's suggestion earlier. What we have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is this. It is about restructuring local government. It is about restructuring services. It is about the way health, police, local government works together. And the budget that Councillor Anthill has presented here today is a step forward to doing that. Because we can't stay as we are. It has to change. It is about the way services need to move forward and not about taking it back to how it was. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is quite clear that what we have here from this Labour group proves they are not up to running this council and clearly they're not up to running this country either. Thank you. Councillor Busby. Thank you, Chair. Um, so it's, it's quite plain and simple, really. It, it would appear that you guys over there, you just don't want to spend £12 million out of reserves. Now, if I could show you how you wouldn't need to touch reserves, would you therefore vote for this amendment and keep the spending right? Because I can show you how you save 12 million, or are you just saying really you want to just shove up reserves and cut services? Because that's the impression I get. Now, we look at the budget, there's always that wonderful line, inflation. Inflation. What is the figure for inflation? I've no idea, but I can tell you it is too high. 
We've been running at what, 1.3, 1.5%, and there's probably 2, 3, 4% in there. I reckon if you looked at inflation, we'd probably get a couple of million pounds on there. Now, Councillor Belfield, you said that you wanted us to come up with some ideas. I've noticed that all of these cuts affect other people. None of them affect us. Now, there's no deflation line in there, but petrol prices have fallen 20, 25% over the last 12 months. Now, we're still getting 45p a mile for that, as are all the staff. Those prices went up when the price of petrol went up. Now, we could be really true to our feelings and say, yes, times are tough. We're we're making it tough for everybody out there. We'll take some of that hurt as well. If you could get the 45p down to 40p or 35p, there's an immediate saving. Graham, highways budget. How much of the highways budget is spent on petrol and fuel? There must be quite a lot in there. 20, 25% saving on that, that all adds up to this 12 million. And then finally, underspend. Jeff, you're very good at this, but you know we always end up with an underspend. Uh, What was it this year? Eight million pounds or something? There will be an underspend. I guarantee there'll be an underspend. So I've got a pound coin here, Councillor Antill, that says if you can get the mileage down to 35p or 40p and the inflation and the underspend, it will come up to that £12 million that you're looking for in this amendment. If it doesn't, you can have this pound coin. I think if you're true, if you're true, to, your, if you're true to your feelings, you will vote for this amendment and rely on the... F- Reserves staying at the level they are today. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the original seconder of the motion, uh, Councillor Len Jacklin. I invite you to uh, carry on with your seconding of that motion now. Thank you. Of the, of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, we've listened to some interesting arguments this afternoon. Uh, but first of all, I want to tell you that We didn't make it up in the last two weeks. We've been running backwards and forwards to Jeff for getting on for two months. We've investigated everything uh, very, very carefully. And Jeff's assured us, he might not agree with us all the time, but he has assured us that we are putting forward a legal amendment. Now, we set out to give a little relief to Suffolk's hardest hit and most deserving causes. And we propose to do this in subsequent years not just this year, subsequent years, until the obscene amount of reserves is brought under control. We're aware of the need to have adequate reserves. We're aware of the need to safeguard the council from unforeseen circumstances. But we're also aware that if the punishing and devastating cuts that continue to be made are not tempered in some way, then there'll be no effective council left and no need for any reserves. Or, Eric Pickles and co. will come along and snatch it all back and buy more digestive biscuits. This is the man who wants to make up the £250 million overspend in his own department. Have you forgotten that? This man who's telling us to make these cuts, £250 million Mm. of overspend in his own department. Now... Reserves are used, uh, uh, for use in times of emergency. And for the rainy days, I've heard it said this afternoon, well, we, this side of the house, we actually think it's pouring down. We actually do. Uh, yeah, we do. And we think that returning a little to our hard-pressed essential services is a better use of our finances. Finding more and more ways of hoarding cash when we are slashing services, is the equivalent of defaulting on your mortgage payments and losing your home whilst having enough in the bank to pay the mortgage for the next five years. (laughs) This amendment... uh, Yes, it is. This amendment is not an attempt to be frivolous, as members opposite accuse us. We've studied the budget items carefully and used due diligence at every step, as any responsible group would. We didn't set out to construct a new budget. We set out to try and mitigate some of the more damaging cuts that have been made and tried to ensure that our funds are made useful. Indeed, 
of the 17 items in the amendment, over half come under the category of invest to save. That's the very thing you were talking about, Ms. Uh, Councillor Ansel. We believe that in the short to medium term, £1 million invested, say in item 8, designed to restore and enhance domiciliary care, will save millions in block beds. And there are many others. The dogma-driven cuts to local government finance have resulted in the loss of thousands of skilled, well-trained and motivated staff. Their skills can't ever be replaced. We're beginning to see the results of this cull of skills. The services we provide disappearing before our eyes. Our loyal, hard-working, skilled staff, they don't deserve this treatment. We're trying to present more losses, such as those taking place in Family Focus, a scheme which shows positive results and whose financial savings to this Council will be leveraged beyond measure. And that's without taking into account the social benefits of the families involved. The three locality managers who have been crucial to identifying the families whose social problems were, were a direct cost to this authority, uh, uh, they've been identified by these three people, you propose to lose them. Our, our amendment would enable their work to continue. And I go again with preserving the best and uh, for the future. In May, an incoming Labour government will reassess the way local government is financed. Grants are not likely to return to the level of 2010 during the course of the next Parliament, but there is no way that any Labour government would continue to impose further and further cuts on vital public services, unlike the Chancellor's plans, which will return us to the levels of expenditure that existed in the 18, 1930s. And let me make this clear and absolutely unequivocal. If we were in administration, we would not tolerate a level of reserves of this magnitude. It's pointless to stash away reserves in earmarked pots where it is clear that amount has never been and never will be spent on the proposed purpose. It's not only pointless but downright evil to do it while we're slashing services. And to do it with the rollish that some members over there seem to do is a betrayal of the trust that the electors put in them. And finally, Mr Chairman, having run a business... I know it's important to have enough working capital to cover eventualities. I also now know how important it is to invest to make my money a better improved product that adds to potential. Too many members opposite have worked in finance making millions of pounds while having no idea how those pounds were earned. <laughs> I've sat in previous meetings, I've sat, listen, I've sat in previous meetings with this council and listened to members opposite telling me why they came to seek election. Let me tell you why I came to seek election. It was to reverse this obsession that everything this council, its officers and its employees do is wasteful and valueless. Councillor Jackson. We on this side value excuse, our officers. Sorry, excuse me, excuse me Councillor Jackson, just for a moment. You've, Last sentence. You've, you've run out of road. Carry on. Uh, finish within the next ten seconds, please. Okay. That's why this amendment's here. It's a small attempt to restore sanity back into this chamber by signalling an end to cuts for cuts sake. Thank you very much. I now call upon Councillor Antill as the holder of the substantive motion. Uh, you may speak for up to five minutes if you wish. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> where to start, really? Um, I'd just like to sort something out for Councillor Otten um, with regard to the SSCs. I'd just like to make something plain about that before I start. Um, the reason they're not in the budget papers is absolutely no decisions have been made about the SSCs. And also, actually, this is not a decision that is one that's to be made by the County Council. It's part of the designated schools budget, which is under the control of the schools forum. And it's the schools forum who will make the decision about whether those are closed or not. So, um, so just, anyway, moving swiftly on. Uh, right. Um, Mr Chairman, the budget amendment proposed by the Labour members opposite has two parts. The first relates to the overall reserves policy of the Council, to which I shall return. The second is a wish list, or I could even say a shopping list, as a good Suffolk housewife, um, to, um, of additional items of expenditure that they would like to see included in the budget. 
These add up to a total of some £12 million. My Cabinet colleagues have already addressed much, uh, many of the specific pro, um, proposals, but at this point I'd merely like to suggest that perhaps the members opposite have forgotten or failed to notice that beyond 2015-16, this Council still has a two-year budget gap of approximately £80 million. And I would draw their attention to the chart on page 31. It's the only item in the paper that might be described as a picture, and it's quite easy to understand. <laughs> to suggest... To suggest that we amend our plans to increase this extremely challenging hurdle to 92 million can only be described, and I willingly use this word again, as quite frivolous. Turning to the reserves, first of all I'd like to dispel the illusion that the reserves represent a sort of pile of gold sitting in a cave when Mr. Dobson and I sit there like a couple of you know, Wagnerian giants polishing it up and seeing if we can hold it to ourselves. No, that is not true. Mr. Jack, uh, Councillor Jacklin um, mentioned working capital, and yes, indeed, we do need to keep some working capital in, in the council, as one would with you know, the, every other business, but at the last balance sheet date, we only had 24 million of cash, which is lubricating the wheels of the entire Consolidated Council, and that's not very much. The rest of the cash is being used to offset and reduce the need for our borrowings. It's working hard on behalf of our Council, and that money is all attributable back to the revenue budget. So that money is not being idly squirrelled away. It's actually working for us all. The Labour Party suggests that a total figure of some £165 million is excessive and points to the fact that in 2010 the total reserves were around £78 million. That's not quite right because if you take the comparable figure, you have to add the capital reserves to that to um, adjust it to like with like. They imply this is an entirely adequate number. Have they not noticed, Mr Chairman, that some £135 million of our reserves are there to fund existing expenditure programmes or to support the directorates in coping with timing differences and short-term eventualities. Labour is the party of big government, and it's a surprise to see them suggesting by implication we should be doing less for the community in reducing these commitments. I suspect that's not actually what they mean, but I do suggest that their comments indicate either willful denial or total ignorance of this Council's budgeting and accounting processes, and I'm disappointed that Mr Dobson's lessons have not been more but well attended to. <coughs> out of the earmarked reserves, I would like to point out that 10 million are scheduled to be spent in the year 1516, um, and there will also be some spending of the capital reserves. But I can't promise that those reserves will not be topped up from elsewhere. If we are lucky enough to bid for money for particular projects and we can't immediately undertake those projects, they will go back into reserves and we'll be having this same discussion again. <coughs> it's true that a small part of the reserves are underallocated. You suggest that this is an excessive number, but in response I'd just like to quote from an open letter written in January of this year to Melanie Dawes, the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Communities and Local Governments, a chum of Eric Pickles, and the letter is from the Chief Executive of SIPFA. He says... For the avoidance of doubt, SIPFA's guidance to chief financial officers is clear that at a time of increasing financial risk, a council making cuts should also increase reserves to reflect the greater volatility of its budget. DCLG should promote prudence and not claim that one-off spending of reserves could solve ongoing budget pressures. In summary, Mr Chairman, I find it quite extraordinary that the Labour members of this Council could put forward such proposals at a time when their colleagues in Westminster are attempting to restore the nation's confidence in their ability to manage the economy. This is clearly not the right way to achieve that, and I strongly recommend that we vote to reject their proposed yeah. amendment. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, colleagues. We now will move to a vote on the amendment.
Now then, is everyone ready to vote? I will now uh, start the vote, but before I do, if you support the amendment, please press 2 on your keypad for yes. If you do not agree with the amendment, if you do not agree with the amendment, please press 3 on your amendment, and if you wish to abstain, then press 4. Thank you. Vote now. Has everyone voted? Thank you. Then I'll close the vote. Sorry, Mr. Leader. The results are as follows. 30 in favour of the amendment and 38 against. The, motion, the, the, the amendment is lost. The amendment is lost. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like, uh, if I may, to um, suggest to the meeting that I think absolutely everything about this budget has actually been said this afternoon. There can be no further amendments that can be tabled, and I would therefore suggest that we move to the vote, because it's either a case of you agree with it or you don't. So I move that we move direct to the vote, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, Councillor B. That's a suggestion. Is everybody in favour of that? Hands in the air, please. Those against? Those against? That's over well, That's unanimous. So we now move to a vote on the substantive motion on the budget. Do not vote as yet. Do not vote as yet. <laughs> Whoops. Oh dear. That's a alarm stage right. Is, is, every, is everyone ready to vote? I'll now start the vote. Remember. If you if you if you support the motion. Please press 2 on your keypad to vote yes. If you do not agree with the motion, press 3. And please press 4 to abstain. Vote now. Thank you. Has everyone voted? Thank you. The result is 37 votes in favour of the budget and, and 31 against. So the budget is carried, the budget is carried. Thank you very much indeed. All that remains for me now to say to everybody is thank you very much indeed for your forbearance during a long session. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Thank you, everybody. A safe journey home. Good night.